for right. that. All right. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Irving Jaffe, a member of Temple B'nai Sholem in New Bern, North Carolina, along with my co-chair, Andrea Drayson from Anderson, South Carolina. We are honored to chair this evening's program. We have a wonderful program for this evening. The number of people on the call is testimony to how much the topic of the history of our Carolina Jewish communities resonates with you. Can everybody hear me okay? I guess yeah, we're all muted. Okay. <laughs> we're grateful to the Greensboro Jewish Federation for a grant to support the work of the Carolina Region Small Congregations Initiative, organized by the Jewish Community Legacy Project. JCLP works exclusively with small congregations, helping them plan for their current and long-term needs. But first, <clears throat> we must keep in our hearts the suffering and pain of our brothers and sisters in Israel. We pray that Israel will soon prevail and we hope the Jews and Israel's non-Jewish friends will help with the recovery and healing of those who have suffered injury and those who have lost the past few weeks. Every Shabbat, a prayer is recited for the state of Israel. I would like to read it now on behalf of everyone here in this evening. Our God in the heavens, bless the state of Israel. Shield it with your love. Spread over it the shelter of your peace. Guide the leaders and advisors with your light and your truth. Help them with your good counsel. Strengthen the hands of those who defend our holy land. Deliver them. Crown their efforts with triumph. Bless the land with peace and its inhabitants with lasting joy. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Tonight's program is divided into two parts. The first presentation will focus on the Jewish experience in North Carolina. The second presentation will focus on the Jewish experience in South Carolina. After the two presentations, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. I encourage you throughout the two presentations to send questions in the chat. These will be answered by our speakers. <clears throat> it is now my pleasure to introduce Leonard Rogoff to speak about the North Carolina Jewish experience. Leonard Rogoff has taught at UNC, Duke, in North Carolina Central. Former president of the Southern Jewish Historical Society, he is currently historian and president of the Jewish Heritage of North Carolina. He is a frequent lecturer and contributor to journals, anthologies, and encyclopedia. His books include Homelands, Southern Jewish Identity, and <laughs> Go to the bottom and there. Sorry? His books include Homelands, Jew Southern Jewish Identity in Durham and Chapel Hill, North Carolina, year published in 2000, Down Home Jewish Life in North Carolina in 2010, <clears throat> and Gertrude Weil, Jewish Progressive in the New South in 2017. Leonard, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Noah, do you want to start with the PowerPoint? Um, okay, North Carolina, but by rights, I think Rachel should have actually gone first. Uh, Rachel and I have somewhat different stories to tell. I, uh, not, not to steal her th th thunder, but I assume that she'll be talking mostly about the Old South legacy uh, beginning in Charleston, which is one of the early colonial. Excuse and, uh, me, one, excuse me one second. Uh, it, do you see a uh, a a screen in on the uh, uh, PowerPoint, or do you just see the PowerPoint? I mean, I see. I only see the PowerPoint. Okay, that's fine. Okay, but I was just going to say our story is quite different than the story of South Carolina, which is an old South story. Uh, in fact, many people did not think relative to South Carolina and Virginia and Georgia that North Carolina actually had a Jewish history. Uh, our story is primarily going to be one of the New South and the Sun Belt. Uh, North Carolina has had among the smallest percentage of Jews of any state in the country, though not in absolute numbers, but Jews have always been more significant than their uh, numbers would indicate. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in fact, uh, Jews have been here uh, from the from the very first. The 
1585 and Raleigh's expedition to Roanoke Island, uh, the metallurgist was the uh, sometimes described as the very first scientist in America was Joachim Gantz, a Jew from uh, Prague. And we know that he was a Jew for when he returned to England in 1587, he got into an argument with a carpenter from the mining company in which he asked, what need hath God for, for a son? And he was arrested for blasphemy and confessed that he was a Jew. Um, moving on, there is very little to draw Jews to North Carolina. It had a swampy coast. It didn't have any significant ports relative, let's say, to Charleston or to Savannah. Uh, no real navigable rivers. Um, but um, we still had a early Jewish presence. I, I think you're probably all familiar with the um, three waves theory of Jewish migration to America, which I'm not very fond of, sort of works, but but not really. But there was a very early first Sephardic settlement. And we do find Jews in the, even in the colonial era on the North Carolina coast. Uh, and they had names like Rivera, uh, Lopez, uh, Gomez, and they were, uh, many of them were related to the uh, famous um, um, merchant in, uh, Sephardic merchant in Newport, um, Aaron Lopez, who put members of his family as agents for his coastal trade up and down uh, the East Coast. Um, uh, again, there was very little to draw Jews um, to uh, North Carolina when, uh, when North Carolina wrote its con state constitution in 1776, it included a uh, religious test forbidding, uh, stating that only believers in the truth of the Protestant religion could serve in office. In 1808, Jacob Henry, a Jew from uh, Beaufort, was elected to the legislature and his right to serve was challenged, uh, though that he was seated uh, on, on, a, on a technicality. Uh, in the antebellum years, North Carolina had the reputation as the Rip Van Winkle state and was actually losing uh, populations. Uh, towns in the countryside were emptying as uh, the populace moved uh, into Louisiana, Texas, and, and farther west. Um, the real uh, 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 in 1835, North Carolina, Noah, do you want to move on, please? Uh, in 1835, uh, North Carolina revised its constitution and began a program of internal improvements. And this era coincided with the German Jewish migration to America. Uh, again, uh, they came from German principalities. What was the pushing factor? We always talk about immigration in terms of the push and the pull. Uh, the pushing factor was the uh, poverty. Uh, the discrimination that Jews suffered that restricted their rights of residence, restricted the trades they could practice, they were forbidden to the guilds, and then uh, some of the principalities, uh, even whether they could marry. Um, the uh, Jews, uh, after the failed revolutions of 1848, the liberal revolutions that uh, uh, offered the Jews the the Jews had the aspiration uh, that the overthrow of the, the, of the monarchies would grant them civil rights, uh, but these uh, uh, hopes were crushed by the Prussian army, and Jews began immigrating at rates that quadrupled that of other Germans. A uh, German Jewish writer spoke of the uh, Jewish addiction to America, and letters from uh, immigrants and, uh, and newspaper articles appealed to Jews to come to America. And this was a stage migration. Uh, first, the Jews, the uh, German-speaking Jews, arrived in port cities, New York, Philadelphia, and increasingly Baltimore. From 1850 to 1901, the Jewish population of Baltimore increased from 700 to 35,000, and Baltimore became the gateway to the Southeast. Uh, in fact, I always like to describe Baltimore as the not the geographic capital of North of North Carolina, but as the uh, uh, in some sense the social, cultural, and religious capital of Jewish North Carolina. And the pull of North Carolina for Jews was uh, North that this rural state uh, resembled the places that they had left. These Jews who arrived here were what they called Dorfjuden. Uh, village Jews from Bavaria, Wurttemberg, uh, and in the 
what they found here was a rural countryside that was very familiar to them. And that they resumed their trade as, um, as peddlers and petty merchants, as middlemen between the city and the country. Typically, you might have a father, an uncle, uh, who was a wholesaler or an importer, and he gave you credit and goods, and you headed out into the countryside uh, to, to make a living. Um, um, by 1841, we count 48 North Carolina towns with Jewish stores, most of which are on the coast or in river ports. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and look, uh, if you look at the R.G. Dunn credit reports, uh, Jews are almost invariably identified as, um, uh, as, as Jews. Um, next slide. Um, uh, H. Mitchen, Mitcherheimer of Rocky Mount uh, is uh, in 1858, according to the red, uh, credit report, is Jew, hawks or pedal goods with a wagon. Such men are always regarded with distrust here. And this was a very, very typical story. If you want to see where Jews are settling, follow the railroad. In the 1850s, uh, North Carolina uh, embarked on the construction of the North Carolina Railroad, which went from um, uh, Goldsboro uh, in the east uh, to, to Charlotte. And all along the railroad, little villages turned into mill and market towns, places like Durham, Greensboro, Salisbury, which had just been little country crossroads, all of a sudden became places where farmers would go to, uh, could now go and to market their cotton or their tobacco or peanuts. Uh, mills, uh, tobacco factories and mills began to arrive. Uh, uh, and again, here, for example, we see Goldsboro, which was the intersection of the Weldon and Wilmington Railroad, which when it was built in 1841, was the longest railroad in the world and the East-West North Carolina Railroad. So you'll see a, a number of Jewish stores here. My resolution isn't good enough in this photograph, but you'll see the H. Wheel and Brothers store in the background. And again, the Jews were arriving as, as Jacob Rader Marcus famously quipped, no Jew was ever the first to come to a town. He was always preceded by his uncle <laughs> or brother. Uh, and you'll see H. Wheel and Brothers. And the story is, uh, uh, Herman Wheel's sister had married a Baltimore peddler named Henry Ettinger. Uh, Ettinger, when he wanted to open up a store, sent his uh, sent Herman, his brother-in-law, to Goldsboro to run the store. Uh, Herman served in the Confederate Army, and when he left for the Army, he brought his Henry, his brother Henry, in to run the store. After the war, they brought their younger brother Solomon, uh, and it was a, a again a kind of a a family network, and uh, Jews had an ethnic niche in uh, dry goods. And you'd start seeing these dry goods store, the same pattern repeated uh, across, across the landscape. Uh, all of a sudden, from a rural state, oh, thanks to the railroad, Jews had access to markets in uh, Baltimore, New York. Uh, cotton could be shipped to the coast to, to be sent to New England or, or uh, over to England itself. Uh, when the Civil uh, War uh, arrived, arrived, where did Jews stand? Well, every study that has ever been made of Jews and slavery uh, indicates that Jews did not differ from uh, other whites uh, in their ownership of slaves. If a Jew had a need of slave, a Jew would hire a slave. With the, the difference is that Jews were very, very rarely uh, plantation owners, except South Carolina might have another somewhat different story. Uh, so it would typically, a, excuse me, it would just be a household slave, or as you see this Jewish merchant selling his slaves, uh, or you might have a, if you, for example, sold lumber and hardware in your store, you might hire a slave carpenter and rent out the slave. Um, and when the Civil War rose, next slide, please, um, Jews, um, uh, flocked to the to the Confederate Army. Uh, Albert Loria was killed at Seven Pines. Um, Herman Wheel's uncle Leopold Ettinger was also killed in battle. Um, and again, these were mostly just recent uh, German immigrants who asserted their patriotism. 
uh, although I can't really illustrate it, probably the most significant contribution uh, of Jews was as um, uh, purveyors, uh, cotton agents, uh, merchants. Uh, in, in Wilmington, and numbers of Jews, including Solomon Bear sitting there on his horse, was uh, owned ships and was a blockade runner. Uh, they might have a relative in England serving as, as their agent. Uh, Jew, Jews were providers of uh, uniforms and garments, uh, uh, textiles uh, to the South. Uh, next slide. Um, at the end of the Civil War, the question uh, with the slaves read, uh, the South was reorganizing its society. Uh, in 1868, uh, the Reconstructionist Constitution finally eliminated the um, Jewish uh, disability to serve in public office. And the question arose, where did the Jews fit in the new social order of the South? Uh, Jews were increasingly looked upon not as members of a religion, but as members of a race, with the racial consciousness that arose with the uh, liberation of the slaves. Um, and there was even some questioning the whiteness of the Jews. The most um, outspoken defender of the Jews was the Civil War governor, uh, who was still held until very, very recent times as North Carolina's most distinguished statement, Zebulon Vance, uh, who would later be, serve the U.S. What a great Senate. word. That was a great name. And, and Vance, Vance himself um, was always a, a friend of the Jewish uh, people. Um, and uh, he was also nationally known as a speaker on the Chautauqua circuit. He was a, a, a dynamic orator. And his most re requested speech was called The Scattered Nation which was a, a philo-Semitic uh, speech in praise of the Jews. He called them, the Jews are our spiritual fathers, our, our wondrous kinsmen. And he refuted the um, uh, accusations and calumny thrown at the Jews. Uh, read today, I find uh, the Jews still to this very day honor uh, the memory of Zebulon Vance. Uh, I find his speech to be racial gibberish and embarrassing to read because he exalts the Jews at the expense of African Americans, whom he regards as barbarians and, and uh, savages and so um, in the worst racial kinds of terms. Um, and again, you know, where did Jews stand on the question of after at the end of Reconstructionism in 1870, 1877, um, as I said, when the South is reorganizing its society? Uh, there were immigrant societies in the South. There was, uh, in North Carolina especially, a desire to bring Im white immigrants in to redress the racial imbalance caused by the liberation of, of the African Americans. Uh, Jews didn't have a particular position and uh, or even a particular politics. There's no such thing as a Jewish politics, really, until 1928, when Alfred E. Smith ran for the presidency. And we can see this in the most infamous year in North Carolina history. North Carolina was unique in the South in having a black Republican uh, fusion government uh, in the 1890s. Uh, and in Wilmington, there was an infamous race riot uh, in which a, uh, a, 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 a city government supported by blacks, uh, in which they held many important positions, uh, was overthrown. The mayor of Wilmington before and after, although not during the riot, was Solomon Fishblate. And Fishblate was at the lead of the mob that marched to a black newspaper and burned it down. Uh, the author of the White Declaration of Independence that was declared at the time uh, was Nathaniel Jacoby, a very prominent Jew in both the synagogue and in city politics. Uh, on the other hand, if we go up the coast to New Bern in the 1890s, We'll find a sheriff there, Joseph Hahn. Uh, the Hahn family was very prominent in the early formation of the Jewish community, and Joseph Hahn himself would become president of the B'nai B'rith Lodge. Uh, um, with Black support, Hahn, Joseph Hahn was elected sheriff of Craven County, and he stood in front of a Black, of a mob, of, of, of a black political rally uh, urging Blacks to fight uh, for their rights. And as sheriff, he became infamous. And you can see this racist cartoon that appeared in the Raleigh News and Observer when Han chained a black and white prisoner together and marched them off to 
a prison in Raleigh, and this caused an outrage. So again, Jews were no different than other any other uh, white Southerners. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the 1870s were also the years of uh, institutional uh, birthright years of institutional Judaism in America, as well as in North Carolina. Uh, one, there's an increased German Jewish uh, immigration, mostly this time coming from Prussia. Um, the first Jewish institution in North Carolina uh, follows the Talmudic injunction, first the cemetery, then the city, uh, as I think most of these places had one dead Jew before they had 10 living ones. So the Wilmington Cemetery actually be formed uh, the, uh, was uh, open before the Civil War, but starting after the war, 1867, we see a Jewish cemetery society in Charlotte, 1870, uh, uh, a Raleigh Hebrew cemetery, 1874, Durham Hebrew cemetery. Next slide, please. And then the uh, first synagogue, which still stands and is still in, in use, in fact, has just been recently restored, was the Temple of Israel uh, in, on Market Street in downtown Wilmington. Next slide, please. And then in the 1880s, 1890s, early, uh, we start seeing uh, synagogues arise across the um, uh, the landscape. 18, um, um, uh, 1902, actually, uh, Asheville uh, purchases a church, the synagogue in 1886 in Goldsboro. Uh, just this last Sunday, I was at the recently restored 1892 temple uh, in Statesville. Move on, please. Um, and again, these synagogues are arising uh, as the South is urbanizing and its uh, churches are being constructed at the same time too, uh, as these little villages with the emergence of the railroad and the industrializing of the South uh, starts, uh, 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 evolving from an agrarian society and into an industrial one. And Jews play their role in the creation of what's called the New South. In 1886, the Atlanta journalist Henry Grady delivers a famous speech in uh, New York in which he calls for a New South. Uh, the, the South, as he says, will out Yankee the Yankee. He preaches what's called the gospel of indus industry, that racial harmony will prevail and the call became, bring the cotton mills to the cotton fields. And uh, the South begins uh, its transition uh, into industrialism. Uh, the number of textile mills from the 1880s to 1890s quadruples. Uh, the number of, uh, of, of, of textile workers grows nine times as country folks start flocking into the cities. Uh, and Jews, again, are very prominent in this development. Moses and Caesar Cohn create a, uh, two Baltimore Jews create a textile empire in Greensboro. I think they own 16 mills employing tens of thousands. Saul Bear is the largest distiller uh, in the state of North Carolina at a time when the liquor industry was uh, quite uh, prominent in the state. Uh, the Wallace brothers who were merchants in Statesville uh, build the world's largest herbarium, taking roots, berries, and bark in exchange for merchandise until they're shipping ginseng by the ton to Europe, and, uh, to China, and opening up European markets. In fact, just this last Sunday, I was in Statesville, where the state dedicated a historical marker for the herbarium. Next slide, please. Uh, the rise of the New South uh, coincides with the arrival of East European Jews. And again, this is a family chain migration. Moving on, please. Uh, again, the pattern in, the, in, in North Carolina is quite different than you would see in the New York. In New York, something like 75% of the Jews are employed in the garment industry, the proletarians. In the South, it's uh, in, in Durham, for example, I think it was like uh, none. Uh, and it's just the reverse. In uh, Durham, 75% are uh, employed as merchants, independent uh, storekeepers, and so on, uh, versus something like 16% in, in New York. The number of Jews with the Eastern European migration grows from 18, 850 or so in the 1870s uh, to over 8,000. Uh, again, uh, in the 1880s, Buck Duke of Durham goes up 
hires Moses Gladstein to bring some cigarette rollers down. About 100 Jews come to Durham to roll cigarettes. Of course, they what do they do? They form a union. They start radicalizing the local workers. And Buck Duke is glad to mechanize and get rid of them. Next, please. Um, and again, we see the typical example of the East European Jews repeat the German pattern. They start as peddlers. Uh, they move to an area from coastal Edenton, A.M. Schrago moves to Goldsboro, where he opens a store. Next, please. Uh, and again, the family store, what they called in the South, is the Jew store. Uh, if you, Mr. Mann in Whiteville is so proud of being Jewish, he puts a Star of David uh, on his store sign and on his shopping bags. Leon Levine starts with a uh, discount basement in his parents' department store, and then until he opens the family dollar store in um, uh, Charlotte, which grows into a chain of 6,000 stores. Heilig and Myers start as secondhand furniture dealers in uh, Goldsboro and become the world's largest retail furniture dealer. Moving on. Uh, and again, every town seems to have at least one Jew store. Uh, every downtowns are anchored by Jewish owned department stores. Scrap peddlers build scrap yards. Some of them are now uh, recycling or steel fabricators. Moving on. Next, please. Uh, and again, with the arrival of the East European, the number of synagogues in the state rises from one. Uh, to 22. And these are cathedral style synagogues that attest to Jewish permanence and prosperity. Moving along. Uh, and Jews acculturate as Southerners. One thing that brings them into the South is World War I, where Jews joined the patriotic uh, efforts. And uh, the first North Carolinian to be killed in World War I is Arthur Bledenfall of Wilmington. The airport is named for him. The sports field, Harry Schwartz is captain of the UNC football team in 1928, and basketball especially becomes a Jewish sport. Moving on, uh, the second generation leaves the store, uh, gets college educated. Uh, Jews are rising in social mobility up into the middle class from their immigrant poverty. Next, uh, World War II has a similar effect to World War I. The um, effort, the patriotic efforts bring Jews uh, together uh, that demonstrates their Americanism. And that includes women who are gathering together to wrap bandages for the Red, ba Red Cross and participate in civil defense. Next, please. Uh, and the Holocaust really um, discredited racial thinking. Uh, there were numbers of distinguished uh, German, uh, well, European Jewish immigrants uh, Louis Stern at Duke coined the term, from, came from Hamburg, who was famous for uh, coining the term intelligence quotient. Raphael Lemkin coined the term genocide. He was uh, uh, stole, he was smuggled through the, the lines from, from, from Poland and was the author of the Genocide Convention, of the, of eventually adopted by the United Nations. Black schools were also open. Uh, in Eastern North Carolina, next slide, there was a, a agricultural colony of, of Holocaust, of Jews uh, escaping the, the Holocaust, which lasted for about 10 years as these artists, professors, and executives were not very good at dirt farming. Uh, next move, please. And in the post-war religious revival, which affected uh, uh, Christians as well as Jews, there was a spate of church building, we start seeing new synagogues rising across uh, the landscape. Um, uh, as the veterans returned home to start families and and uh, and the, with the move to the suburbs. And very often this um, uh, involved a uh, change from Orthodox Judaism to conservative Judaism. Uh, in um, 1900 or 1910, I think I counted about a dozen Orthodox synagogues. By 1960, there were none. Move on, please. Uh, a lot of these synagogues were seeds, that the seeds for these synagogues were planted by the circuit riding rabbi, I.D. Blumenthal of Charlotte, uh, came up with the idea of outfitting a bus as a synagogue, which would go to places like Swananoa, Black Mountain, uh, Four Oaks, places that did not have, may have one, two, three Jewish families. Uh, so this bus was outfitted as a synagogue. 
uh, and he would conduct Sunday schools and services. And in larger communities like Whiteville, Kinston, uh, Lumberton, uh, people were inspired to uh, build synagogues, create congregations. Next, please. Uh, and the Jews had them a sense of themselves as an extended family. Uh, there was the North Carolina Association of Jewish Women, the only such organization in the state. They went off to uh, usually to Chapel Hill, where you had a, a sister to date, uh, a brother fraternity brother would have a sister to date uh, for another fraternity brother, or they went to Camp Blue Star, where the Jews all got to know each other. And they were united by their B'nai B'rith lodges, by Hadassah, and so on. Next. Uh, they even had their own uh, Jewish debutante ball in High Point. Uh, again, Jews lived in a kind of parallel social uh, um, world uh, as they were excluded uh, from uh, country clubs and debutante cotillions, though this began breaking down after World War II. Uh, next, please. Uh, and again, with the break down, breaking down of social barriers, we start seeing Jews elected as mayors. Uh, Mud Evans served six terms in, uh, in Durham. Benny Schwartz and his brother Bill Schwartz are both mayors of Wilmington, but also in small towns like Lumberton and, and Elizabethtown, where the only Jewish family might be uh, hold, the only may, uh, hold the mayor of the town. Next. Uh, the most famous, though not the most characteristic Jew of American Jews, was Harry Golden, the publisher of the Carolina Israelite, who was a national celebrity, who had a uh, circulation of, his Carolina Israelite had a circulation of 60,000. Um, moving on, and of course, North Carolina basketball, crazy state, two of its mythic heroes were Lenny Rosenbluth, who led North Carolina to an undefeated national championship, and Art Heyman, who was the uh, national player of the year in 1963 for Duke. Moving on, and it was climaxed probably in 1971 when Connie Lerner, the daughter of uh, Jewish Holocaust survivors, was elected Miss North Carolina. And you notice she's brown-eyed, olive-skinned, dark-haired. She's not your southern white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, southern belle. And the runner-up that year is an African-American. Uh, next, please. And again, the, with the rise of the civil rights movement, uh, North Carolina society is changing. Most Jews knew Blacks as employees, as nannies, as house cleaners, as clerks in their store, uh, not on basis of social equality. Uh, moving on, uh, most Jews found themselves in a difficult position. Uh, they had historically catered to Black trade. On the other hand, they feared a white economic backlash. There were numbers of Jews uh, among the early freedom riders. Harry Golden was nationally famous as an advocate for civil rights. Howard Lowenstein, a UNC student who came back to teach at NC State, uh, organized the civil rights movement in uh, uh, Raleigh and in Chapel Hill. Uh, Gertrude Wheel, who had been the leader of the suffragist movement in North Carolina, was also an activist in her native Goldsboro and led to the integration of the town. Moving on, uh, again, after the war in the 60s, the South is changing. A new term enters the uh, Southern Lexicon Sunbelt. Uh, there's white flight into the suburbs, economic activity moves to the suburbs, rim econ economies with big box stores and shopping malls uh, empty out downtowns, Jewish stores start closing, urban renewal removes a lot of them. And going on, and again, the Jews are making a demographic change. No longer are they so much involved in retail trades. They're not storekeepers or peddlers. Uh, now they're professionals. North Carolina calls itself the, uh, the state of the arts. And we see again, Jewish artists, the uh, rise of the universities and the breakdown of barriers, uh, discriminatory barriers uh, and the movement into high tech and uh, a cosmopolitan global economy. And Jews are in the forefront. Again, there's a half a dozen, I think, uh, North Carolinians who won the Nobel Prize. Three of them are Jews. Moving on, uh, and again, we can see this, uh, downtowns are being re reinvented. Downtown is no longer a place where you go to buy things, to go to the stores. It's a place where you go to eat and go to a movie and Jews and, or uh, healthcare has become a major industrial project and Jews have been in the forefront of that. 14 Jewish municipalities have had Jewish mayors. 
Mel uh, Cohn was nine time mayor of Morganton, currently the mayor of Whiteville and Asheville are Jewish. And moving on, uh, and for the first time, Josh Stein, the attorney general and candidate for governor is the first Jew to be elected to statewide office. Uh, Mandy Cohn, the first, not Mandy, Kathy Manning, the first to be elected to Congress from North Carolina. And, uh, and again, we see this in the profusion of uh, temples with the rise of the Sun Belt. There's something like 45 Jewish congregations and these new suburban Sun Belt temples are arising. And Charlotte uh, Temple uh, Israel, I think, has, has a thousand members moving on. And the last thing I'd like to say, and appropriate, uh, considering the situation with Israel, uh, North Carolina Jews have always had a loyalty to Israel. I start seeing evidence of emissaries arriving from Zion as early uh, as the very early 1900s. Um, in the middle there, you can see Gertrude Wheel and Morris Leader of Goldsboro with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt sign signing a Zionist proclamation. Uh, I have pictures of North Carolina Jews with Shimon Peres, Gold in My Ear, and David Ben-Gurion. Uh, and virtually every home, you'll find a tree certificate and a Jewish National Fund pushka. And with that, I know I've gone on far too long. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Leonard, for an illuminating and inter interesting presentation in the Jewish experience in North Carolina. It's now my pleasure to turn our attention to South Carolina for a presentation by Rachel Barnett. Rachel Gordon Barnett is the executive director of the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina. She has been an integral part of the society for more than 17 years, serving as a board member and as president of the organization. Her professional career spans 30 years in the advertising, public relations and special events industry. Uh, Ms. Barnett is a board member of the Friends of the Library at the College of Charleston Libraries, University of South Carolina Society, Columbia City of Women, and Columbia Jewish Heritage Initiative. She is the co-author of Kugels and Collards, Stories of Food, Family, and Tradition in Jewish South Carolina, and this was just released by the University of South Carolina Press in 2023. A few words about the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina. The Jewish Historical Society was founded in 1944, 1944, sorry, 1994, to study, preserve, and promote awareness of the history and culture of the Jews of South Carolina. Originally begun to preserve memories about small town Jewish life in South Carolina, the society has expanded over its 29 year history to provide conferences, a biannual magazine, and documentation of Jewish burial grounds and Jewish merchants across South Carolina. Membership in the society is open to all. For information, go to jhssc.org. And Rachel, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, um, everyone. And thank you, Noah, for inviting me tonight. Leonard, that was really illuminating because um, I actually lived in North Carolina many years ago. So it's really interesting to, to learn our histories are similar. Um, but tonight, I'm not gonna start at the beginning of South Carolina's Jewish history, even though Charleston, as we all know, had uh, Jewish settlers from the get-go, from the very beginning, from 1695. And by 1800, Charleston had more Jews than New York. Of course, it went downhill from there. But rather, I'm gonna talk about a project that the Jewish Historical Society has been working on since 2016. And it's, um, we're really digging down deep into the Jewish merchants of South Carolina. So uh, let's get started. So the Jewish Merchant Project begun in 2016. Um, Historic Columbia is our research arm. Every year we have two researchers there that work with me. We have a a map of South Carolina we are systematically going through. We have 700 plus merchants on the site as of today with 96 communities. This is, if you go to our website, uh, merchants.jhssc.org, you will see that this is a map of South Carolina. The stars with the little numbers indicate how many merchants there are. And there's a whole um, stories about every family. There are also um, long format stories that people have submitted to us. So it's been a very interesting uh, 
project and one that uh, we keep digging away at slowly. Um, the initial work was led by Dale Rosengarten. Many of you may know Dale. She's recently retired from the College of Charleston. And um, she gathered artifacts, oral histories, and built the Jewish Heritage Collection at the College of Charleston. Uh, we also documented merchants in our magazines, which we publish twice a year. So in 2016, it came to the realization that we have these stories, but they seem to be scattered throughout. So we began building this website and systematically going and actually trying to document the stories. And um, so a sample. So a sample of early partnerships. Now, I will uh, confess that we have not done a great job yet on very early merchants, say the 1700s. This is an area that we will explore. We've, um, I, we're working with a couple of folks on that. But some of these early merchants, as we know, Charleston was landing post there. But um, Jews were always made welcome in South Carolina, and they were welcome as traders and as merchants, and in the beginning, they populated Charleston and Georgetown, the coastal towns, but then they moved inland, and uh, the 19th and early 20th century, many immigrants looked beyond the port cities and took up peddling goods and establishing stores in rural South Carolina. So by the late 1800s, Jewish merchants had set up shops on downtown streets in cities large and small. More than 100 years later, their legacy remains alive through their descendants and their stories are many of our stories. So you can see here a list of some of the earlier merchants. Kaminsky was Georgetown still coastal, but we have Red Top, we have Columbia in the 1820s, um, we have B.J. Barnett and Sumter, Moses Levi and Manning. Uh, we have documented many of these. And when you go to the site, you will see there's a short stories, long stories, as much information as we can gather. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to explore a few themes that we have come across by doing uh, this project. Faith and business. So from its inception, the Carolina colony in the state of South Carolina provided Jews broad opportunities to engage in business and to practice their religion. However, one area of disagreement between Jewish merchants and local governments were the blue laws. For example, in the early 19th century, a battle between Alexander Marx and the city of Columbia offered officials and sued over Sunday openings. And in 1828, shortly after moving to Columbia, wealthy Charleston native Alexander Marx established a boarding house on the 1700 block of Main Street. Advertisements in the South Carolina Gazette and Columbia Advertiser claimed it served the best wines and liquors. They also established a reading room containing papers from different parts of the Union. In 1833, Marx was arrested for violating a religious statute that banned the sale of goods on the Christian Sabbath. A founder of the Hebrew Benevolent Society, Marx argued the ordinance violated his constitutional religious liberties as practicing Jews observed Saturdays. Shortly after the Supreme Supreme Court dismissed his challenge and upheld the law, Marx relocated his family to New Orleans. More than a century later in Charleston, Sam Solomon engaged in a similar fight. Although Jewish merchants eventually evolved to remain open on Saturdays and stay closed for business on Sundays, Jewish businesses generally closed for the high holidays. And you see the ad there, that's from um, Beaufort for all of their stores that went together. I myself grew up in a small town and my father would close his stores for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I remember those signs. But let's talk about a bit about the Jewish merchants of South Carolina. The family stories that we will share are reminiscent of most merchant histories. The themes of family migration, peddling as starting point, community service and tolerance are woven throughout. If you And let me just give you a pitch. If you know of a merchant's or you've had a family store and you don't see us see it on the map, please reach out to me and let us know. Even if you don't have a lot of information, you just give us a little bit of information. We have researchers. They'll go dig it up. So um, we're going to consider the transition of merchants from peddling to prominence. 
Uh, a common story in South Carolina Jewish families was that granddad began peddling with a pack on his back, earned enough for a mule and wagon, and eventually opened a storefront. According to Steve Whitfield's essay, Merchants, the Mara Southern Jewish Experience, beginning in the antebellum period, virtually all peddlers were Jews. Virtually all Jewish peddlers were first generation Americans, and virtually all Jews who established shops began their career as peddlers. They were the acorns from which acorn oaks sometimes grew. The startup expenses were small, burdened with a pack, but basically no overhead. Peddlers needed very little capital. They prized independence, didn't have to endure intolerant or obnoxious bosses, nor did they face legal barriers of bringing their wares from one plantation or farm to town to another. A, a few noted families on the slide that took this route, um, Sam Sarasky and Aiken, and you, you notice the image up there, that is a peddler's license, which uh, comes to us from Aiken. Steve Silver is going to speak about this. This was a real find when we uh, discovered this. Mars, uh, Marcus in Utahville began um, as a peddler. He immigrated to New York from Russia in 1901 and then traveled to South Carolina after that. He initially began as a peddler, but he soon opened Marcus Department Store in Utahville, South Carolina. Israel Fromm was born in Lithuania in 1878. His wife was born in 1879. They knew each other growing up and fell in love. He immigrated to Worcester, Mass and lived with relatives and then Bertha joined him and they were married and moved down to Union. So the tale, um, what brought them to the Fromms to Union is a typical one of chain migration. Bertha's cousins were there and they peddled in North Carolina uh, the Berlins and um, with their base in Moncure near Raleigh and then in Burlington and later in Haw River. So there's uh, a little bit of back and forth between South and North Carolina. Uh, Israel began peddling the northern part of Union County and then he settled in uh, Union, uh, South Carolina. And is uh, Harry Fromm, this, there's the store there, was in business for many years. Um, we also have um, Nathan Blott, he was born in Russia, occupied Poland, and he came to uh, South Carolina. He initially peddled in Charleston, and then he and his family, including his son Solomon Blatt, um, settled in Barmel. Well, actually, they sell in Blackville first, and then he was a merchant. And you can see this little piece in here that we found in a, a newspaper. A man born in Poland saw his son preside over the House of Representatives of South Carolina yesterday. How do you think he does? He was asked. Pretty good, in my opinion, he replied. Nathan Blatt of Barmoy saw the first light across the seas, but is now a thorough growing American and loyal Democrat. His son was um, Solomon Blatt, who would become Speaker of the South Carolina House of Representatives. So from modest beginnings to major enterprises, these stores may have begun as small merchants in these small towns. Some moved into the cities and um, became um, larger and open locations. We have uh, Edwards in Charleston and locations throughout South Carolina. Uh, Sam Solomon, through much of the early 20th century, Sam Solomon wholesale jobbers would stop the shelves of store owners and fill the packs of the newly arrived immigrants. But in the 50s, Solomon's sons and son-in-law shifted from wholesale to retail and opened a catalog showroom, which was kind of a, a new concept for the time. And in the 60s, of course, they made headlines by challenging the blue laws. Baker Grocery in Columbia was um, an institution in Ward 1 in Columbia. And it was uh, one of the, uh, there in 1967, Clara sold her store and contents to one of her um, employees, an African-American employee, Oscar Shealy. Uh, the building, unfortunately, was torn down due to urban renewal um, in Columbia. We have Brody's in Sumter, and uh, they also had stores in North Carolina as well, the Brody family. And Fershkotz, Slovakian Matt's Fershkot, arrived in Charleston in 1865 and partnered with uh, and dried those with his brothers and the family spread out south, north, and west, establishing successful department stores 
as you can see, in Charleston, Florence, Orangeburg, Goldsboro, North Carolina, and Jacksonville, Florida. So the last theme I'm going to meant talk about are African American community and Jewish merchants. Jewish merchants welcomed Black customers. Many allowed African American customers to try on clothes when non-Jewish businesses did not. Jews recognized early employment of Black salespeople and clerks. They handled the delicate balance between showing respect and courtesy to African American customers and avoiding impressions challenging racial customs of the day. We have Martin's Men's Shop. This was in Beaufort. Uh, they were the first store in Beaufort to allow Black customers to try on clothes. Store was the first in Beaufort to hire an African American salesperson, Pauline Dixon, who's in the photo. Lurie's in Columbia was founded by immigrants Louis Lurie and his wife Annie Friedman Lurie in 1912 in St. George. The brothers or their sons brought Lurie's into Columbia, the son Saul and Mick, and established Lurie's department store on Main Street. Uh, they had a better relationship with Black customers than other white-owned department stores. And in 1949, Lurie's was the only store willing to rent tuxedos to 50 male Allen University students serving as ushers during a performance of famed Black soprano Marian Anderson at the Township Auditorium. Uh, Somerville Bargain Store, and you see Samuel Lynch sitting outside of the store there, he was the first of individuals to lease buildings to African-Americans, specifically to two barbers. The family had several businesses in Somerville, among the Somerville Bargain Store, a liquor store, and Seymour's uh, department store. And south of the border, as uh, many of you probably have visited or you see it on your way up 95, um, Robin Schaefer, who is a nephew of Alan Schaefer, remembers, before there was state and local funding for underserved youth in schools, Alan Schaefer fed many poor kids. Before passage of the Civil Rights Act, he hired everyone, whites, African-Americans, and Lumbee Indians. And in the era of Jim Crow, I can remember Black people coming to the door of my dad's business and asking if it was okay for them to come inside. His answer was only if your money's green. He never discriminated and I'm willing to bet that Alan didn't either. There's a story that uh, there was a Klan protest at South of the border during Jim Crow because they employ people of all races. Alan met the Klansman with a rifle and told him to go away. To me, that was a mitzvah on steroids and that is a, a reminiscence from a nephew of Alan Schaefer's. So we have a fading world, and it was, you know, this generation of merchants, of immigrants who come to this country, they open their stores, they're running nice businesses in their communities, they become community leaders, but the next generation, your children grow up, they go to college, and in one generation, they become part of the professional class, and many times, they don't go back to that town. We have a uh, Dubin's in King Street and Warshaw's in Walterboro, Stern's uh, Department Store in Andrews, Polykoff's Jewelry in Anderson, and Henry Jewelers in Anderson. Um, and these are just a sample of that fading, that world that has faded away. Um, but uh, along with that, we have some stores that have hung around. Well, they hung around to at least to Corn Blutes hung around to 2010. Benny's Five and Dime in Williston and Whitlet's in St. George. Corn Blutes, that's Moses Corn Blutes, staying from his department store. And uh, De Polykoff's in Abbeville, which they made it to the year 2000. They were they made that century mark. They're pretty incredible. Um, some of these other stores, Greenville Army Navy store is still here. Britain's in Columbia is still Price's Men's Store in Berlin's in Charleston. These stores are still open. And um, that is an old picture of Price's Men's Store. We do have a newer one. Uh, very nice picture. Um, but I know time is, we're running over time. So let me give a few minutes quickly to Steve Silver, who is the president of congregation out of Yeshrun and Aiken. He's going to talk about how they use the Merchant Project for their 100th anniversary. Steve? 
Thank you, Rachel. Exactly right. Uh, uh, we we worked with uh, Rachel and Dale and the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina as part of our centennial celebrations. Uh, and I, I'll give a little background on what we did, but I think the more important uh, point is the impact that uh, this initiative had both on our congregation and on our relationship with the with the broader Aiken community. Uh, uh, the, the, what you see there is the, is the, the logo that we uh, had for our uh, synagogue uh, for the 100th anniversary, uh, which was in 2021. Uh, and like a, a lot of uh, the synagogues in this uh, cohort that uh, Noah has organized. Uh, we're a small uh, uh, congregation with an aging membership, and we were looking for ways that we could increase the visibility of our congregation and, and hopefully uh, through that process, increase engagement and attract new members. And we were lucky enough that we were an early participant in the Jewish Merchant Project uh, uh, that uh, Rachel described. Uh, we had uh, participated with, with, in particular with Dale, and a shout out to a congregant who's uh, recently passed, Doris Bumgarten, who was kind of the historian of the synagogue, uh, in collecting oral histories and a lot of the information about the history of the Aiken Jewish community, which fed, fed into the work that Rachel shared. And we had held celebrations both at the 75th anniversary and the 90th anniversary and had good connections with a lot of the descendants of the early Aiken Jewish families that had founded our, our congregation. And something that Rachel didn't mention, we were uh, inspired. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Jewish Historical Society. We'd gone to a uh, uh, one of the meetings in Charleston, I think in 2019, where it was the opening of an exhibit at the College of Charleston that, doc that uh, presented a lot of this material called A Store at Every Crossroads. Uh, and that uh, uh, basically was the beginning of us deciding we were going to feature the story of the Aiken Jewish community in our own exhibit uh, and bring that uh, some of the panels from that store of, uh, at every crossroads exhibit up to bring that into a statewide uh, uh, context uh, and make that uh, the, uh, the the core of these centennial celebrations. And so we we. Uh, 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 organized and created uh, an exhibit with some additional research on the story in Aiken uh, that uh, uh, that opened at the Aiken County Historical Museum actually in 2022 because COVID delayed the kind of in-person celebrations for a year. That, uh, that uh, exhibit was called A Source of Light. And this, the, the, yeah, the idea, A Source of Light, has uh, reflects kind of two themes that comes from the story that I think uh, uh, both our presenters today have, have, have described. First, that the Jewish community in Aiken, like in a lot of places, was a source of light to the, to the broader community. Uh, it was a source of good, not just through the commerce that they provided, but through the civic leadership that a lot of the people uh, in Aiken and, and other places provided. Uh, not just actually in Aiken, but on a statewide level, and in some cases with some of our uh, uh, the families of some of our congregants at, at, at a national level. And the second piece, which is a, an important part of the theme we were trying to get across, is that this story, uh, this story of tolerance and inclusion uh, is itself a source of light to all of us today and going forward in the, in the community that, that we're all a part of and that we wanted to, to kind of embrace that. So we organized a, a centennial celebration weekend. We had the, the picture you see here is a, in front of uh, our synagogue where we had over 100 uh, uh, people uh, attend that weekend, uh, many of whom were the descendants of these early Aiken Jewish families that came from all over the country uh, to celebrate uh, with us. Uh, and uh, uh, again, it was a weekend of events that included a Shabbat service, so that that is the picture on the steps uh, after that. And uh, next slide. Uh, and we also uh, uh, unveiled a new historic marker uh, in, in Aiken uh, through the Jewish Historical Society. There was already a marker in front of the synagogue uh, that, that told some of the story. But this marker is actually on Lawrence Street, which is the main commercial street in Aiken, and, and in particular highlights the contributions of Aiken's Jewish merchants uh, 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 to, 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 uh, uh, to the community. Uh, and, uh, and then next... Uh, 
uh, here's some some pictures from from the from the exhibit itself, which ran for three three months at the Aiken County Historical Museum and actually went on for another six weeks uh, at the new Augusta Jewish Museum. Uh, and you can see on the in the picture on the left, the panels that are in the middle of the room are the panels from the uh, uh, a store at every crossroads exhibit that tells the statewide story that uh, that Rachel uh, just went through, and all around the outside of the of the uh, is a, a story that tells kind of a chronological story and uh, and uh, quite a bit of detail on the uh, uh, on the store on the, and the picture on the right of the retail uh, shops with profiles of each uh, 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 of each merchant, uh, and there were over uh, we identified almost fifty Jewish owned businesses in Aiken with with uh, over twenty. Uh, in operation at the peak in the, in the 1950s, uh, and uh, I guess just close with uh, a, 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 a couple of comments on, as I said, about what this has done for us. Uh, it has absolutely increased the visibility of our congregation in Aiken, uh, and uh, we've been lucky enough that uh, in this past year, we a year ago, we added uh, over 20 new members to the congregation. This current year, we've added another five to six new members. I can't say that all of that is due to to this initiative. I, I think the ending of COVID probably had uh, you know some impact, and the fact that Aiken is a town that is a popular retirement spot, and we have kind of a, a, a steady stream of, of folks uh, coming here from other other places. But being out there and and uh, and being visible, I think th th this initiative ha has had a big impact. And the other piece of the of, of the story is the relationship that this has done to increase the uh, and, and reinforce the connection of the Jewish community in Aiken with the town more broadly. Uh, there are a lot of this is a story that's fading fast, as Rachel was talking about. These, you know, these stores are no longer there. But there are a lot of people who remember, uh, you know, the, the, those Jewish merchants and those Jewish merchants who were civic leaders. There was a mayor of Aiken. There was the first Jewish woman in the South Carolina State House was 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 from Aiken, uh, and and on and on. The, the, those people and those businesses are still a part of the uh, of the fabric of the town uh, uh, for a lot of those people, and it's very much. A source of pride that that this community is a part of Aiken and and people want that to continue. So one of the things I think we've done, and it's particularly relevant in the time we are now with what's going on in Israel and and so forth, that that uh, you know that we are uh, seen as a uh, as an integral and positive part of the, of the communities that that we live in, and I think we've had a, uh, a really positive impact from that side as well. So I don't know to the extent to which this is a model that can uh, other synagogues in this uh, cohort may want to follow, uh, maybe not the entire piece, but but uh, but maybe pieces of what I've described. I, I think it's really been a great initiative for us. And, and I want to thank uh, Rachel and the Jewish Historical Society for helping us uh, make that happen. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. And it was a wonderful weekend. We were so pleased to be there and be a part of it. There was so much enthusiasm and energy. The tour was great. The walking tour of Lauren Street. Yes. The panels, um, let me just make a mention. This was um, the centerpiece for our 25th anniversary of Store at Every Crossroads. It was an exhibit that we had at the College of Charleston. The panels now, we have them placed with the South Carolina State Museum and they're part of their traveling exhibit program. So they are available for organizations. If anybody on this call, if you think this might be something that you wanna do in your community, these panels are available. You can reach out to me. Um, Sumter used them very effectively, very similarly. They you use this in, as a centerpiece and then you can document and highlight the merchants of your own community. Additionally, um, the Jewish Historical Society has been pleased to partner with cities and towns to um, um, with the historic markers. These are put place through the South Carolina Department of History and Archives. We will be unveiling one in Rock Hill in November. We've been working with the town of Rock Hill, so it will be a similar um, marker uh, that will go there. And so we're real pleased to partner and work with, with towns um, on this initiative. So I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea and um, say thank you to everyone for letting us be with you tonight.
Thank you, Rachel, and to Steve for a unique commentary on the contributions that South Carolina's Jewish merchants and entrepreneurs had on the well-being of the state. We now have time to hear from you. Noah Levine will read the questions from the chat. If you have questions or comments, please use the raise hand icon. Click on reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen to access the icon. If you cannot, then unmute and introduce yourself. We ask every speaker to give your name and the city and state you're calling from. Noah? Does anybody have uh, questions or comments? Uh, I, I have, we, we only have a few minutes. Uh, two, two things I wanna say. One is that I'm going to send out uh, Rachel and Len's contact information. If you have any questions regarding your synagogue with respect to archival material or oral histories or anything to preserve the legacy of your congregations, then uh, they're the people for you to contact. Uh, and we'll be sending out a recording of this uh, of this session also. Um, I have one quick uh, question, probably is a long answer, but you can just make it as short as possible. Uh, can you, can Len and Rachel speak about the philanthropic impact that uh, the Jewish professionals and Jewish businessmen have had throughout the history of your, uh, your states? I know that there's some prominent philanthropists today, Jewish philanthropists today. Has this always been the case uh, in, uh, in your respective states? Len, I'll turn it over to you first. Well, as I said, North Carolina's history is more especially a history of the of the New South and the Sun Belt. So it's all been most recent. Uh, certainly, yes, there's virtually not a city in North Carolina that does not have a hospital endowed by Jews. Uh, Moses Cone uh, Hospital has given birth to Moses Cone Healthcare System that was established by uh, uh, the estate of of, uh, of Moses Cone. Um, there's uh, the, the Levine Museum of, the, well, first the Museum of the New South, the Levine Children's Hospital, Brenner Children's Hospital in Winston Salem, Heinemann Hospital, and in, in, um, in uh, also in Charlotte, and notably the Brody family, which has roots in both North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, and um, the the family in in Greenville. Uh, the, uh, the 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 brothers endowed the uh, medical school at East Carolina University, which is now the Brody School of Medicine. So it's been it's really been quite pronounced. And more recently in the arts, uh, if you go to Charlotte, there's the Blumenthal Arts Center downtown. But you'll see even in small towns like Goldsboro, where the Wheel family has endowed a cultural center in the Paramount Theater, which they once owned in Wilson. Uh, uh, Stephen Leader, for example, just a little small town. He's been sort of the cultural entrepreneur of the town. So yes, Jewish philanthropies are all over the, the built environment of, of North Carolina. Thank you, Rachel. Well, I would suppose similar, um, sort of like what Leonard says. I'm trying to think back over the generations, but yeah, yeah the built environment particularly, but in the arts, the small towns of South Carolina, if you go and you look, there was always Jewish leadership. They were mayors or they were on town council or they worked behind the scenes to make sure things happen for their community. Um, the, the colleges, if you think of the College of Charleston, we have Adelstone Library um, at the College of Charleston. Um, of course, the uh, Klein family, uh, you see names on the buildings at the college, as well as at the university. So I think philanthropy is probably something that's uh, just sort of <laughs> part of that um, in the DNA. Uh, Danielle Kowalska, will you unmute? You have your hand up. Danielle. All right, she put in the chat, Danielle put in the chat, uh, can anyone tell me how long the Brody family has been in North Carolina? Um, well, they were originally a South Carolina family. And again, this was fairly typical. I think there were nine brothers 
and maybe one sister and um, you know, the brothers had a, like the leaders, the stadiums, a num number of these families had stores all across uh, the, the, uh, a two state, sometimes the Southeast. Um, and I believe probably about the 1920s, they came to Kinston and Greenville and more especially they had the Pe Pepsi Cola franchise, I think, but they, uh, the Brodies had a department store chain um, uh, which I don't think is still being operated. I know they moved into the malls uh, and then then sold out. Um, but they're it's, they're still in in Greenville and and, and still quite philanthropic. I I did an oral history interview with Mo Morris Brody before he passed away, and I believe they were here as early as the 1920s, or I should say as late as the 1920s. But again, they came up from South Carolina where they were first established. There, there's on our website, there under Merchant Stories, there is a family history that was submitted to us by Mark Brody. Thank you. Angie, you want to? You want me to wrap up? All yeah. right. Thank you to, to Leonard Rogoff and Rachel Barnett for interesting and informative presentations. As Noah said, the Zoom has been recorded and it will be emailed to all registered um, participants. And here's some information about future events. Temper, Temple Soleil in Fort Mill, South Carolina, on Saturday, December the 9th, is hosting Joe Buchanan, a Jewish Texas bluegrass singer. Everyone's welcome to attend. Tickets are $10 per person, and we'll get some email information to everyone. The Carolina Region Small Congregation's 2024 schedule will feature a session on Jewish cuisine. We invite people to share their favorite Jewish recipes. We'll also schedule programs on Israel and on Jewish diversity. Information will be forthcoming. We wish everybody a good evening and keep Israel in our prayers. Thank you and good night. Good night all. Night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night.